So I'll be talking about joint work with Ryan O'Donnell on improving the sample complexity of shadow tomography. Uh, but before we get to the quantum problem, let's consider this simpler classical problem to set intuition and expectations uh, for the quantum case. So suppose P is a distribution on the integers from one to D. And suppose furthermore that P is not known, but we can take samples from P. And we have the following problem where we're given M events, E1 to EM, which are just subsets of one to D. And we want to estimate all of their probabilities to plus minus epsilon error with high probability. So to do this, we can just take N samples from P and output the empirical probability of each event as determined by these samples. And we know that if we apply a concentration inequality, we can show that log of one over delta over epsilon squared samples from P will yield an epsilon accurate estimate of the probability of one of these events, except with probability delta. So now we can just apply a union bound to get epsilon accurate estimates for all of the events. So we can solve this problem just by using log M over epsilon squared samples from the distribution P. Now, this works in the offline version where the events E1 to EM are known ahead of time. Um, if the events can be picked adversarially, then we can no longer apply the union bound in the analysis. So this approach does not work. Now, in the quantum case, uh, we start with a mixed quantum state rho, uh, which we suppose is unknown, but we have measurement access to unentangled copies of uh, rho. And the shadow tomography problem um, says that given observables A1 to AM, which are bounded above by the identity, we want to estimate all of their means or probabilities, uh, which are of the form trace of rho times AI, to plus minus epsilon error with high probability. Now, in the quantum case, there's an issue in that unless these observables commute or naturally form a measurement, uh, it's not at all clear how we can measure our copies of rho uh, to simulate the sampling process in the classical case. So there are a few special cases. For instance, if the observables commute, then we can measure in their common basis and we can essentially emulate the classical case. Or if they form a measurement or, or if their sum is bounded above by some constant times the identity, then we can form a measurement from them by normalizing and, uh, and sample and get to the classical case. But in general, um, one thing we could do is to try to estimate each of their probabilities independently. However, because there are M events, uh, this requires M copies of row at least. And in the classical case, we saw that this should be possible with something closer to log M um, samples. So we would expect something that is polylog in M and D as a good and as an efficient solution for this problem. Um, we can try to learn the whole state row uh, using our copies of row. And we can learn an estimate that is epsilon close in trace distance, um, which is sim similar to just learning the distribution uh, to, epsilon, uh, to epsilon accuracy in total variation. Uh, but this will require, in the quantum case, it will require d squared copies of rho. And furthermore, this method is a bit overkill in the sense that it will give accurate estimates for the probabilities of essentially all of the observables that are between zero and one, and not just the ones from A1 to AM. So ideally, what we would like to do is to learn a hypothesis state rho hat, uh, such that trace of rho hat AI is a probability that's close to trace of rho AI, uh, but only for all of the events A1 to AM, not necessarily all of the observables. Um, and sometimes I will just call uh, these observables also events um, in the quantum case, but I understand that they're observables between zero and one. Um, so here we have this um, algorithm on online learning of quantum states. So suppose that rho is a mixed quantum state as before, and we have the following scenario. Uh, there are two parties, one is a teacher and, and the other is a student. And uh, we assume that the teacher will present a sequence of observables, A1, A2, A3, and so on, uh, to the student. And what the student has to do, uh, given one of these observables, the student must output an estimate of trace of rho AI, which we will call mu i. And the student will output mu i hat, which is his estimate. 
And if, if the student's estimate is close to the actual probability of trace of row AI, then the teacher should just move on to AI plus one. And if the estimate is far away from trace of row AI, then the teacher should declare a mistake and supply a better estimate that's closer. Now, in this scenario, uh, Aronson, Chen, Hazan, Kale, and Nayak uh, showed that, um, so suppose the teacher has the following properties. If the estimate from the student, uh, mu hat t at step t, is more an epsilon away from the actual probability, then the teacher should always declare a mistake and supply a better estimate. If the estimate of the student is uh, within three quarters epsilon of the actual probability, then the teacher should pass. Uh, to the next observable. And if a mistake is declared, then the teacher has to supply uh, their own estimate, mu prime t, which is within one quarter epsilon of the actual probability. So what Aronson et al. showed was that there's an algorithm for the student in this case that makes the most log d over epsilon squared mistakes. And uh, essentially the way the algorithm works is that the student maintains a hypothesis state rho hat t, and at each step when a mistake is, um, is declared, the student has to uh, update his hypothesis based on the uh, better estimate that is given by the teacher. Now, using this online learning um, algorithm for quantum states, uh, we see that if we are able to implement an algorithm for the teacher, then we can solve the shadow tomography problem just by uh, running the algorithm for the student and the algorithm for the teacher at the same time. So in previous work on shadow tomography, um, pretty much all the algorithms uh, follow that uh, pattern. So Scott Aronson introduced uh, the shadow tomography problem in 2017, and he proved um, a version of the learning algorithm which had log D over epsilon cube dependence. And he obtained uh, an algorithm for shadow tomography that uses uh, log to the fourth M times log D over epsilon to the fifth copies of rho. Now, Aronson, Chen, Hazan, Kale, and Nayak then improved the online learning algorithm um, and, and got log D over epsilon squared sample, co sample complexity for it, not sample complexity, but the number of mistakes a student makes, and improved the epsilon dependence for shadow tomography. And then Aronson and Rothblum, um, inspired by techniques from differential privacy, uh, gave a slightly different algorithm uh, for shadow tomography that still uses this online learning algorithm. And uh, their uh, method um, obtains the best dependence uh, with respect to the parameter m. So they get log squared m, uh, but the dependence on log d and epsilon uh, is quadratically worse. So uh, in this work, we study the following problem, the threshold search problem, uh, where we're given observables a1 to am, and we're promised that um, the probability of some ak with respect to rho, so trace of rho AK is at least C uh, for some fixed C from between zero and one. And we're tasked to find uh, an AI with a probability that's at least C minus epsilon. And we showed that there's an algorithm for the online version where the observables are given in an online fashion uh, for threshold search that uses log squared M over epsilon squared copies of rho. And because, uh, and then we showed that you can use this, uh, I mean, this is known already by um, in Aronson's first paper on shadow tomography, you can use uh, threshold search to implement the teacher in the online learning algorithm. So uh, as an application, we obtain an algorithm for online shadow tomography um, that uses uh, log squared M times log D over epsilon to the four copies of rho. So this has the best dependence on all the parameters, M, D, and epsilon uh, currently. Um, another problem that we look at is uh, hypothesis selection, uh, which is essentially the quantum version of the classical hypothesis selection problem. So we're given M hypothesis states, sigma 1 to sigma N, M, and um, we have measurement access to uh, copies of a state row, which is unknown, um, as usual. And we want to find a sigma k, which uh, among the hypothesis states, which is closest to rho in trace distance among all the other hypothesis states. Uh, now, for this problem, um, you can reduce it directly to shadow tomography. So it essentially, you can obtain essentially the same sample complexity as the shadow tomography problem. Uh, but we also showed that um, there's an algorithm for hypothesis selection that doesn't use already the shadow tomography. Um, 
which um, uses uh, log cubed m over epsilon squared copies of rho. So there's a slight improvement in epsilon dependence at the cost of uh, an extra log m factor. OK, so the threshold search problem appears initially in Aronson's first paper on shadow tomography um, as the gentle search lemma. And Aronson gives an algorithm for threshold search that uses log to the fourth m over epsilon squared copies. And the way his algorithm works is essentially um, by using uh, a quantum aura bound, um, which essentially when you're given a set of observables, uh, it will solve the decision problem, which asks if there is an observable with a probability that exceeds a certain threshold among that set or not. And then he uses binary search to essentially uh, find um, the observable that has <clears throat> a probability exceeding the required threshold. Um, but the issue with this approach is that at each um, step of the binary search, uh, because the test is not 100% accurate, you always lose some precision. Um, so essentially, the amplification that takes place um, uses um, in, as epsilon actually epsilon over log m. So automatically, there's a log squared m over epsilon squared uh, sample complexity that's obtained using this approach. And then you have um, log m's lost along the way. Um, so in the aronson rothblum paper, um, the approach uh, from differential privacy is used essentially to sidestep this gentle search lemma. Um, so what we do in our paper is we use techniques uh, similar to the aronson rothblum paper to essentially solve the gentle search lemma, which we call threshold search. And there are connections that appear to differential privacy and also adaptive data analysis, um, especially since threshold search is, is very similar to, um, essentially it's a quantum version of this sparse vector technique that appears in differential privacy um, that uses this uh, above uh, threshold uh, algorithm. Okay, so what is our algorithm for threshold search? Well, we start by preparing n copies of the state row. And now, um, we, when given an observable AI, we construct the two outcome measurement, BI, BI bar, that depends on this AI. And then we just measure our n copies with BI, BI bar. Now, if BI rejects, uh, meaning that the outcome observed is the one corresponding to BI bar, then we continue to the next observable AI plus one. Uh, otherwise, if BI accepts, then we just halt and output I. So, okay, what is this? mysterious uh, BI measurement. Well, in words, we can uh, define it as follows. Uh, first, we sample um, um, a random variable X that's uh, an exponential random variable with parameter lambda. And this will serve as our noise, classical noise. And then we measure each copy of rho. We have n copies, remember? We measure each copy with the observable AI, AI bar. And we let k be the number of successes, the number of times that ai accepts. Uh, and now the measurement bi accepts if k plus x is at least um, is greater than theta n, for where theta is some threshold that we set. And we reject otherwise. And um, clearly, um, the, the measurement bi accepts, um, but we don't actually observe the outcome of each of the measurements on the end copies. Uh, all of that takes place within the quantum realm. So we only observe whether B, I rejects or accepts. Okay, so B, I has the following properties. Uh, it has an accuracy property. Um, so when we measure each of the copies of rho with AI, AI bar, and then we look at the number of successes, that's essentially a binomial uh, with N parameters, N and trace of rho AI. Um, and the accuracy property says that the probability that B, I is gonna accept when applied to N copies of rho is equal to the probability of this event, this classical event. Uh, furthermore, we have a damage property, which um, essentially looks at um, if you apply, if you start with n copies of rho, and then you apply the measurement bi, bi bar, and bi rejects, uh, then your state is going to collapse to this uh, state, the post-measurement state. And the damage property um, is an equality between the fidelity. So you can think of this as the overlap between two quantum states, the overlap between the initial state, the end copies of rho, and the post-measurement states. And we relate this fidelity to the Bhattacharya coefficient between the distribution SI and the distribution of SI conditioned on the, this event, uh, which is essentially the complement of the probabilistic event above. 
Um, <clears throat> so now we have a connection between accuracy and damage properties of our, our measurement BI and these classical um, quantities, uh, the battery coefficient and its probability. So now we'll look at um, a result on that is a, a purely classical result. Um, so suppose that S is a binomial random variable with parameters N and P. X is an exponential random variable with parameter lambda. And we have an event B, which is defined as the event that S plus X is uh, greater than theta N for some theta that we set. And what we show is that if the event B has a, it's unlikely, so its probability is less than a quarter, then the chi-square divergence uh, between the pro the, these two distributions um, is bounded above by some constant times the probability of the event B times the ratio of the standard deviation of S divided by the mean of the noise. And when we combine this classical result with the damage property from earlier, because we can relate the body chair coefficient to chi-square divergence via Hellinger distance and fidelity, we can relate to trace distance uh, via inequalities. So we obtain the result that um, if we measure n copies of rho, and then BI rejects, uh, then the trace distance between the input state, the n copies of rho, and the output state, the post-measurement state, is bounded above by some constant times this expression, where we have the standard deviation of this SI binomial divided by the mean of the noise times the probability that the event BI is going to accept. So what we can do now is that we can set the parameters n uh, to be log squared m and lambda to be at least root n, which is um, so lambda is at least root n because that will control the standard deviation of the binomial. And n is log squared m because uh, when we look at the accuracy property, we can show that if trace of rho ai is uh, bounded uh, away from the threshold by a constant, then we can show that the probability that bi accepts when this uh, holds is at most some small constant times one over m. And uh, in terms of damage, we can show that the trace distance between the initial n copies of rho and the post-measurement state is bounded above by some constant times the probability that BI accepts. Now note that the damage property here is actually a quadratic improvement uh, over the, the statement known in the quantum literature as the gentle measurement lemma, uh, which essentially uh, gives you a bound on the trace distance on the amount of damage that a, me a measurement can cause um, but the bound is actually square root of the acceptance probability of that measurement. So this is a quadratic improvement. Now, we're gonna need one more ingredient um, in our analysis of a threshold search. So suppose that we have two operations, S1 and S2, there are two quantum operations that we can apply to quantum states and consider the following two scenarios. So in one scenario, we start with a state row and we apply the first operation S1 to it. And then we apply the second operation S2 to the output of the operation S1 in the sense that we measure the state row with S1 and then we apply S2 to the state that results following the collapse of the state from S1. And then we have the independent scenario where we apply S1 to a copy of rho, and then we throw away the quantum state, um, the post-measurement state, and then we apply S2 to a, a new fresh copy of rho. So S1 and S2 are applied independently and there, there shouldn't be any correlations between them. Um, so then we want to ask questions such as, uh, how big can the difference between the probability that S1 and S2 accept in these two scenarios? And, uh, here we have this uh, result known as uh, the damage lemma that was introduced in the Aronson Rothblum paper that essentially says that the difference in probabilities, um, and here these are probabilities more generally. So uh, you can ask if any of this, a subset of the SI operations are going to accept or reject. Um, and the damage lemma says that the difference in probabilities is bounded above by a constant times the total independent damage. So what is the total independent damage? Well, the total independent damage is the sum of all the damages that are caused to the initial states the, by each of the operations. So here we have trace distance between sigma i and rho. Rho is the initial state and sigma i is the output state that you obtain after you apply the operation si. Uh, 
And here we have the probability that all of the operations S1 to SM accept in the independent case. And this is the probability that they all accept in the sequential case. So uh, we're gonna use this result to compare probabilities obtained in the independent case to the scenario in the sequential case, which is the scenario that we have in our algorithm. Um, so here's a proof sketch um, of the correctness of our algorithm. Now, without loss of generality, we can, uh, it suffices to show that the algorithm is correct, meaning that it halts and selects a correct AI with some constant positive probability, because we can set up the parameters in such a way that we can always check uh, the result of, so if the algorithm selects an AI, we can always check that that AI has a probability that is at least C minus epsilon. Um, so in the independent scenario, where the algorithm essentially um, uses fresh copies at every, uh, at every well, for every observable. So we, we prepare n copies, we apply the observable, and then we throw them away, and we prepare another n copies and process the next observable and so on. So we know the algorithm halts um, because we know, so in the statement of threshold search presented here, uh, there exists an AI that has a probability at least C. And our test uh, is uh, following amplification and so on. Our test is designed so that by the time the algorithm gets to that observable, it will accept. So BI, where AI is a, is a, is a good observable, will accept and the algorithm will halt. Uh, and we know that the algorithm is correct with high probability because our accuracy property says that if AI is not a good observable, it's a bad observable where its probability is way below the threshold, then the probability that our measurement accepts is bounded above by some small constant times one over M. So we can use a union bound um, to conclude that all of the BIs corresponding to bad AIs will reject with high probability in the independent scenario. So essentially in this problem, um, the difficulty is in dealing with the liminal observables who have a probability between C and C minus epsilon. Um, now, in the sequential case, uh, we proceed as follows. Um, essentially what happens is that the algorithm will start running and whenever it, it um, processes a bad observable, uh, the damage that the measuring with the bad observable causes is not gonna be much. Uh, the damage, the, most of the damage will be incurred when processing these liminal observables um, because the amplification does not give good bounds on their acceptance and rejection probability. Uh, but we can show uh, that there is a minimal step T at which point the probability, if you sum the probability of all the previous events accepting, then that probability is bounded away from one. And we know that by that point, the algorithm will have halted by that step with some positive constant probability. Now, because the sum of the acceptance probabilities of the previous events on the initial state is bounded away from one, um, we can use the damage property uh, to conclude that the total independent damage incurred on the initial states, so uh, as defined within the context of the damage lemma, is bounded above by a small constant. Um, so what we can do here uh, is now we can apply the damage lemma and using the damage lemma and this star property, we can bound the probability of error in the sequential scenario by comparing it to the independent scenario. And since we know that the algorithm is gonna be correct um, and it will halt in the independent scenario, we can deduce that the algorithm is uh, gonna be <clears throat> correct with some constant positive probability in the sequential scenario, which is the real world scenario where our algorithm is applied. And that proves um, the threshold, that's a proof sketch of the threshold search theorem. Um, so we get a log squared over epsilon squared uh, copy complexity. Now we know that there's a lower bound for shadow tomography of log M over epsilon squared or D squared or over epsilon squared if D is smaller, much smaller than uh, M. Uh, so now the question is, the open question is uh, whether problems like threshold search can be solved with log m over epsilon squared instead of um, log squared m over epsilon squared. Okay, thank you.